Well, last time we defined categorical products and saw that they were, uh, that Cartesian products were an example of categorical products. Um, and for that reason, or for reasons like that, we usually write categorical products as products. Um, but we have to be a bit careful about this because it's one of those categorical moments where we write A cross B, but this isn't completely uniquely defined. And I started mentioning this at the end of last time. Um, whereas A cross B as a Cartesian product is uniquely defined as that actual set of ordered pairs, A cross B as a categorical product is just kind of any product. Um, but they're all, they're all canonically isomorphic to each other, which is why we don't really worry about it. Um, so what does canonically isomorphic mean? Well, you might think it means that given any other product, there's a canonical isomorphism with that one. Well, you have to be a, bit, a little bit careful about that. Um, because actually, you need the entire diagram to commute. So the point is that supposing that we have a product equipped with its projection maps, and supposing we have another product, and I don't really know how to write it now, but supposing this is another product, it also has to come equipped with projection maps. And the point is that there has to be a unique isomorphism between those two products that actually makes the entire diagram commute. And this is a very important thing to remember when you're doing limits and co-limits, that it's not just the object that you're interested in, it's the entire diagram it, that exhibits this thing as the limit that you're thinking about. And one example you can think about to perhaps make this clearer is if you think about taking the Cartesian product of the set containing the elements one and two and the set containing the elements three and four. Then the Cartesian product is a set of pairs, one, three, one, four, two, three, two, four. Now, that's just a four-element set, right? So that's isomorphic to every other four-element set that there is. But that doesn't make every four-element set just like that into a product. Because to make it into a product, we have to decide what we're going to regard the projection maps as being. And when we've done that, essentially what we've done is we've decided which of our four elements is secretly going to be acting as, as these things. So, for example, we could just say... Um, X, Y, uh, orange, monkey. That's a perfectly good, albeit rod stupid, four element set. And this is isomorphic to that one. And you could express that as the product of these two sets. As it sits there now, it doesn't look an awful lot like a product of those two sets. But if we equipped it with these projection maps, then it would become a product of these two sets. And what we really have done would be, being, would be to have kind of matched up these and say, well, secretly, x is just going to be a rather odd name we've given to 1, 3. y is going to be a rather odd name that we've given to 1, 4, and so on. Uh, and it, once we've done that, we would get a unique isomorphism between this set and this set. Because, of course, before we've done that, the isomorphism between these two isn't unique. And that's why the uniqueness of the isomorphism between these two things is so important. So the thing to take away from that load of uh, wobble is that these things are unique up to unique isomorphism. They're not unique, and they're not just unique up to isomorphism. That's not enough. They have to be unique up to unique isomorphism. Um, right, so now let's have a look at a few more examples of products to try and uh, just see how these things arise in various different categories. So we've already seen that there are Cartesian products in set. In the category of topological spaces, you also get products. You take the pro how do you take the product of two topological spaces? Well, you take the Cartesian product of the underlying sets, and then you equip it with the product topology. So I don't know what to write now. You get the product topology. Um, so another place you can take products is in the category of groups, where you can take the Cartesian product of two groups. And that's absolutely fine. Um, another place you can take them, well, if you restrict to abelian groups, it's still the Cartesian product. But in a slight fit of uh, confusing terminology, that sometimes also gets known as the direct 
sum. Now, in general, sums are going to be dual to products. And when we do co-products in a little bit, we'll see that that's exactly the dual notion to a categorical product. Um, the reason this is also called a direct sum is because, in fact, it's a product and a co-product in abelian groups, because abelian groups are so very special. And vector spaces, because they're based on abelian groups, have the same thing. So you can take the Cartesian product, and that's also the same as the direct sum, and that's the categorical product. Another place you can take products is in the category of categories, where you basically you take the, the Cartesian product of your objects, and then you do the similar kind of thing on morphisms as well. So here the objects are pairs A, B, where A is in A and B is in B, and then morphisms, a morphism from A, B to A prime, B prime, is going to be a pair of morphisms F, G, where F goes from A to A prime, and G goes from B to B prime. Uh, another quite interesting place you can take products is inside any posets. I'm not going to take products of posets at this point, but remember that if X is a poset, you can regard it as a category by putting a morphism from X to Y every time X is less than Y. So you encode the ordering as X less than Y. Now, if we start off with this being a totally ordered set, then, so in a, a totally ordered set, if it's a totally ordered set, then the product under these circumstances, well, what's it going to be? We've got our X and we've got our Y, and what we want is some element which is less than X and less than Y, but sort of the best possible one. So without thinking about this too precisely, no, what's the best possible element that's less than both x and y in an ordered set? Well, you'd hope it's going to be the minimum, and indeed it is. If it's a partially ordered set, what's the best possible element that's less than both x and y? Well, if you sort of dream a little bit, what's the best one out of all, out of all the elements less than x and y? What's the best one? Well, it's the biggest one, isn't it? So that's going to be the, uh, the greatest lower bound, otherwise known as the inf or the, uh, am I going to get this right? It's this one, so it's going to be like intersection, which is the meat. So that's what this is. So in a poset, x cross y is going to be x meet y. And you can think about this like, if you think about the, um, the universal property, you want some object here with projection maps. What do projection maps mean? That means this object is less than x and less than y, such that, given any other element which is less than x and less than y, there is a unique morphism here, which means that given any other element that's less than both x and y, this element v has to be less than the one that we first thought of. And that corresponds to it being not just any lower bound, but the greatest lower bound. Uh, right, what else can we think about? Uh, oh yes, it's important to remember, here's an important non-example, that in general, tensor products are not products, which is kind of why we call them tensor products, not Cartesian products. So for example, tensor products of vector spaces are not categorical products. However, the other way around it is true. So products in a category always give you a kind of tensor product, where by a kind of tensor product, I mean something that gives you a monoidal category structure. So this is jumping ahead of ourselves perhaps a little bit. But if you have products in a category, that always gives you a monoidal category structure on there. Uh, and next time, we'll talk about the dual notion, which is co-products.